So you might be thinking I'm preaching on adultery and fornication today, but no. Um, I'm going to be preaching on this topic, pants and skirts. Pants and skirts. Um, and I'm, I'm just preaching on this topic. Obviously, I know people in this room have different views, but you may have heard in the past that some people, there, there are people out there that believe that it's a sin uh, for a woman to wear pants and for a man to wear a skirt. Now, for a man to wear a skirt, it's probably a bit more socially acceptable to you to accept that it's a sin for a man to wear a skirt. But in the sort of culture we live in, especially in Australia, you may be a bit shocked that out there that some people believe that it's wrong for a woman to wear pants. And I'll explain the reasoning behind it and my position on this, because I have mentioned this before. I know you guys discussed this and I've preached it a long time in the past. So I just thought I would preach this again so you understand uh, when I say, hey, it's not a sin for a woman to wear pants, uh, why I believe the things that I do. But if you, did, if you didn't know, and it's, I don't know if it's only in Baptist circles, but um, there, there are people out there that believe it's a sin for a woman to wear a pant-like garment, and, and likewise a man to wear a skirt-like garment. Um, and, and that obviously is usually more acceptable for people to hear, to re receive that doctrine of a man not wearing a skirt. But oftentimes, you know, when women are told not to wear pants, and it's actually a sin to wear pants, not just that it's less modest, that it's actually a sin to wear pants, it immediately raises some questions. I know when I first heard about this doctrine, because obviously, you know, when, before, I, 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 before being in Baptist circles, I'd never even heard about this doctrine. And I first heard about it when I heard the teaching from Stephen Anderson at Faithful Word Baptist Church, you know, them saying, hey, it's a sin for, obviously, for a man to wear a skirt. It's a sin for a man, uh, for a woman to wear pants. But when you think about when a woman can't wear pants, it, I don't know about you guys, but when I think about it, it immediately raised some questions for me um, when I first heard about it. One was, you know, like, what, what does a woman do when she goes swimming? I remember when I was at Faithful Word, and you know, Elizabeth had only first got saved. I learned this doctrine. I'm like, okay, you know, I learned this. And I want to be dressing the right way according to you know God, if that's the truth. So I was making Elizabeth wear skirts everywhere. And then when when we went camping with uh, with Faithful Word, I remember asking Stephen Anderson, like, so at this camping trip, I mean, is there, like because there's going to be swimming, right? So I remember asking him, like, well, what do, what do women wear when they go swimming, do they? And he's like, they wear, they wear a skirt, Victor. And I was like, that is so weird. That's like the weirdest thing to like wear a skirt swimming. And then, you know, they came out with this whole brand about cute and covered. You know, Juja has this brand where she sells like bathing suits that are like skirts. Um, so this is where this idea is coming from. It's this belief that women can't wear shorts. They can't wear pants. So they have to wear a, a skirt uh, swimming. That was one thing, it was kind of like, okay, well, what do women wear when they go swimming? Okay, well, the people that believe this expect women to wear skirts when they go swimming. So I remember Elizabeth, when she went to the camping trip, she wore, she wore a skirt and she went swimming in a skirt as well. And, and I'm not against, I mean, if a woman wants to wear a skirt swimming, I don't have a problem with that. It's just that if a woman would rather wear, you know, some modest board shorts, I don't have a problem with that either. So one was like swimming and then you might think of, and, and you may be thinking of other scenarios when you think of this, like, well, if women are, are only allowed, are never allowed to wear pants, um, what about when a woman goes horse riding or something like that? Some sort of ac activity that, you know, it wouldn't be practical for a woman to wear a skirt. No, 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 the people that believe you have to wear a skirt. No, if you go horse riding, you have to wear the skirt as well. Maybe you have to sit side saddle or, or they'll say things like, well, maybe there are just some activities women shouldn't be doing. If they have to wear pants to do them, then women can't do those activities because they can't dress appropriately for them. You know, these are reasonable arguments. Um, I'm not saying this is the reason why I believe these things. These are just the thoughts I had when I first uh, heard about this. So you might think, well, what about if it's really cold? Like, if it's really cold, is it all right for a woman to wear, you know, pant-like garments? You know, is she only allowed to wear a skirt? Uh, you know, I think about, you know, people that live in like really cold climates and you say, well, you know, maybe, maybe, um, you know, they can wear, you know, a skirt on the outside so they look, still look, but that's not how they interpret this verse, right? They don't interpret the verse like you just, you just look, it doesn't say just look like 
you're wearing a woman's garment. So you shouldn't even wear it. So she can't even wear it under the skirt now because some, some Baptists take it to that extreme that, you know, you, you can't, even like when you go to bed, you can't wear pyjama pants. You can't wear pyjama pants underneath the skirt even because you would be an abomination because you're putting on something that pertains to a man. So another scenario I was thinking of, and I remember asking somebody at Faithful Word back in the day, and, and this is kind of like when I wasn't fully convinced and I did end up taking it on, and then I, I was unconvinced when I got to Lighthouse Baptist Church and they started questioning me about it. I really couldn't defend it. And I was like, you know what? That's why I came to the position I am going to teach you today. But one was like, well, what about bushwalking? Because if you're not allowed to wear like pants underneath your skirt, and you're going bushwalking, you know, the scrub scratch against your legs and things like that. Surely you can wear something to protect your legs. So the guy that I spoke to said, oh yeah, when my wife goes bushwalking with a skirt, she just wears like really long socks, like long socks all the way up to protect her legs. And, and, and that, that, is all, that example has always sat with me because it didn't make sense. Okay, a woman can wear like undies and, and she, could, she could technically wear socks all the way up to those undies. But the moment those socks touch the undies, now you're in sin because now you're wearing a garment that pertains to a man. So it, it, just, just in my own mind, these are, this is the way I would think and I'd be like, man, it doesn't make sense. But hey, well, that's what the Bible says. So be it, right? Because ultimately it's not based on reason or practicality. It's based on what does the Bible say? But does the Bible actually teach this? Because this is really the main verse that it's based on. This is why we read Deuteronomy 22. When people say a woman can't wear pants uh, or a man can't wear a skirt even. So in Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 it says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man and um, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now if you are of that persuasion you might read that and go, man, that, that's as clear as day. Like this is, it's funny when I tell people like I don't believe it's a sin for a woman to wear pants and they're like, but the Bible says it says that women can't wear pants. But, but just read that verse. Is, is that what that verse clearly says? Because when you read this, says what, what this verse is saying is a, a man, a woman sh shouldn't wear men's clothes and a, and a woman shouldn't wear man's clothes. But then the question is, well, what are women's clothes? And what are men's clothes? How do we differentiate between the two? Because this is not specifying what is men's clothing and what is women's clothing. It just says that you shouldn't wear women's clothing and men, uh, women shouldn't wear men's clothing. But what are men and women's clothes? That's really the debate. So there's no debate about the principle that cross-dressing is a sin, because cross-dressing I, I do believe is a sin, but uh, I'll explain a bit later. So nobody's denying the principle that we should wear clothes that match our gender where we disagree is how do, you, how do you determine what is men's clothes and women's clothes? And somebody might make the argument, well, well, it's obvious because you just need to look at the bathroom door and the universal symbol for a man and a woman is a man wearing pants and a woman wearing skirts. Now, I don't deny that these, are, these symbols are used to represent a man and a woman, but is this, how, is this how we prove doctrine? Is doctrine proved by just the symbols that culture uses to represent different things? I, I don't base my doctrine on symbols that the world uses to represent things. I don't base my doctrine on the bathroom door. We need to base our doctrine on the Word of God. And I think the Word of God, when we look at it, I'll show you in a moment, I think you know, there are situations where men are wearing skirt-like garments, but We'll look, at the we'll look at the arguments for and against. So let's look at some of the verses that they'll use. Not one of them is Deuteronomy 22.5. So that's the main verse that they'll use to say, hey, you shouldn't wear men's clothes. And then they just assume that men's clothing is pants and women's clothing is skirts and there's no, nothing else. They, these are the only two garments that are different out of all the garments that we wear. So come, some of the arguments that will be made is, well, there are examples in the Bible of men wearing pants. And Daniel 3 is one of them, where they'll say, look, then these men, this is, these are Daniel's three friends, when they refused to bow to the statue, were thrown into the fiery furnace. It says, then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats and their other garments, 
and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And they'll say, well, hosen is the word for pants. I don't know whether that's what it means in English, you know, because I know hosen in, in, in German is, is trousers. But when you look up that word hosen, because this is what I did, I like tried to get, define hosen and what are hosen, this is the sort of picture that you'll find on Google. So the hosen is, is worn with like a doublet. I don't know if this is the doublet or that's the doublet. But when you look up hosen and they say oh, an old men's garment, it's actually referring to these tights that the men used to wear. You know, you look at old like Renaissance pictures and they've they got like the wig and they've got like the tights. That's what it's referring to. I don't know if that's what they were wearing in Daniel 1, but that's the word that the translators have decided to use, and this is what it's traditionally been called. This is where you get the word pantyhose. Right, so pantyhose, like the tights that people wear. But, you know, maybe, maybe they weren't wearing these tight tights right, in, in Daniel 3. Maybe they were just wearing pants. But another question is, were these even the traditional garments that Hebrew men would have worn? Because remember, these are, these are children now brought to Babylon. And what was it told about these children in Babylon? Well, in Daniel 1, it says, Children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge, understanding in science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So I think it's safe to assume that even if they were wearing whatever garments they were, were they wearing the garments they would normally wear in Israel? Or were they in Babylon and wearing the things of the Chaldeans? Because if they're teaching them the language and teaching them the ways of the Babylonians, surely they're dressing them differently and well, giving them different clothes, giving them different food, all sorts of things. But even if, even if they wore pants, even if you say, well, Daniel's three friends, they were wearing pants, that's what Hosea means. Even if you have an example where men are wearing pants in the Bible, that doesn't rule out the fact that women could have worn them as well because there are other things that men wear in the Bible, like robes and stuff, that women wear as well. But I'll show you that not only are there examples of men wearing you know, pants, if this is an example at all, um, I think there are examples of when men wearing skirt-like garments as well. Another one is Exodus, Exodus 28. Exodus 28. So this is where they'll say in Exodus 28. Now remember, these are instructions given to the priests. So these are not just general instructions given to everybody. These are garments specific to the priesthood. These special, these special garments that they were wearing. And, and, and if you read in Exodus, it's quite detailed about the robe and the, the breastplate and the bonnet and all that sort of stuff. And, and the people within the temple, the priests that would do the work, as well as the high priest. It says here, thou shalt make them linen breeches. And I say this word, see, these breeches is like pants. To cover their nakedness from the loins even unto the thighs shall they reach. Now, one is, are these garments even pants? Because they're only going from the loins to the thighs. So these are more like, sh you know, shorts, in a sense. But why, why would God need to say, if, if men always wore pants... Let's say like that's just all they, 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 never wore, they never wore a skirt like garment like you see in like cartoons and movies and things like that where, and even like you know the Muslims, right? The Muslims wear like that, that sort of skirt like garment. If that's not the sort of thing they wore back then and they always wore pants, well then why would they need, why would God specifically need to give the priest a garment to say, hey look, you need to make these linen breeches to cover your nakedness because when you wear pants, how is your nakedness ever shown? But if you're wearing a skirt-like garment, like a robe-like garment, then there is a way for your nakedness to be shown. And that's why he's saying, hey, this is why you have to make them linen breeches so when they serve me in the temple, their nakedness is not discovered. And, it only, and these are not even describing pants. These are describing more like shorts. So it makes sense. It would make more sense that this is more like underwear that is being described here as opposed to, you know, outer garments, shorts, or uh, pants. Because if they're always wearing pants, why would this need to be specify and again this doesn't mean that women don't wear them also just because it's a direction given saying hey this is what the priest should wear i mean what does that what does that tell us about what other people were wearing it we don't know necessarily just from this verse the last example that somebody might give and you know this one i i, I hesitated to even put this in here because now that i think about it it's 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 such a bad argument for men wearing pants uh, 
But the other argument that I've heard, and, and this mainly comes from Stephen Anderson, for those that even subscribe to this argument, is 1 Samuel 24, where there's the euphemism to cover your feet. And what does that mean? And, and how it's generally taught is to cover your feet is when you go to the bathroom. You know, you go to the bathroom and you, you pull your pants down and your feet are covered. Now, is that what, is this, is this what it is? Is this what it means to cover your feet? Uh, I don't believe so, even though uh, I thought it was in the past because I've never really thought about it. But I'll show you how it doesn't make sense if this is to cover your feet. And what cover your feet actually means is to go to sleep, to take a nap, right? To cover your feet. That's what the euphemism means. Now here in 1 Samuel 24, this is when Saul goes into a cave to cover his feet. And then David comes in like secretly and quietly and cuts off the, the, the skirt uh, of, of Saul's robe. Look what it says here. And he came to the sheep coats by the way where was a cave and Saul went in to cover his feet and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. Now, <laughs> this is why, why I think when you think about it, even just reasonably, why it wouldn't make sense that cover his feet means that you've gone in to do a number two because you wouldn't cover your feet like a man wouldn't cover his feet to do a number one so so Saul is not in there just you know doing a number one if you don't know what I mean by number one and number two you like pee and poo that's a number one he's not just in there doing a number one but think about it, if, if you go in to do a number two generally you put your clothes nearby right I mean you go in with your clothes you know if, if you're wearing a coat at work you generally hang up your clothes nearby and when you're doing a number two, like it's very quiet. So if you would notice if somebody came into the cave, a bunch of people, and cut off the skirt of your robe, you'd be hearing, you'd be like, you know, it's like when you're in the toilet and somebody comes in, it's like, you can hear them, right? So, so just think about that situation. If he's in the cave, but doing a number two, and David comes in to cut off his robe, like how did Saul not notice? But if he's in there sleeping, then that would make more sense. If he's in there and he's sleeping and David sneaks in and cuts off his robe, then it's like, oh, okay, well, that's how he didn't notice. That's how he didn't notice them sneaking in. Now, if you want to find out, well, what does it mean to cover your feet? Because you could, you could say, well, hey, Victor, that doesn't, den that doesn't deny the fact that cover your feet might mean you go to the bathroom. He might have put his robe at the entrance of the cave and went further in. And, you know, you can reason it out. But here's where I think it proves what, what it means to cover your feet. When you think about what does it mean to uncover your feet? Right? Because if you, we can get an example of what it means to uncover your feet, then that would make sense that covering your feet would be the opposite of uncovering your feet. So in Ruth, number, in Ruth chapter 3, this is where we read the story of Boaz and Ruth. And if you remember, you know, Ruth being the Moabitess, going with Naomi, going into the, you know, and then she ends up, you know, Boaz and all that sort of stuff. And this is in chapter three is when Naomi gives instruction to Ruth to say, hey, this is what you're going to do with Boaz to try and like sort of get his attention, right? So in verse three, it says, wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee. Get thee down to the floor, but make not thyself known unto the man until he have done eating and drinking. So he's saying, wait for Boaz to stop partying and celebrating comes to come down and then it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie and thou shalt go in and look at this and uncover his feet and lay thee down and he will tell thee what thou shalt do now if to cover your feet means to do a number two this would be very awkward for Naomi to tell Ruth okay when he's done eating and drinking and he's going to go cover his feet, which means he's going to go to the bathroom. You're going to go and lay at his feet and uncover his feet. But wouldn't it make more sense that no, what's happening is he's gone for a nap and now she's uncovering his feet, lying at his bed. Lay thee down, he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, all that thou sayest unto me, I will do. And she went down unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, his heart was merry. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn and she came softly and uncovered his feet. Now here I think is the nail in the coffin for this whole he's, doing a, uh, he's going to the bathroom. Because remember, he's covering his feet. She's come 
uncovered his feet, laying down side, and it says, laid her down, and it came to pass at midnight. So she's laying there for quite a while before he wakes up and realizes, hey, there's a woman that's uncovered my feet and is laying there. Now, if he's in the bathroom, and he's in the bathroom for a really long time. So that is like the nail in the coffin where, okay, well, this is what it means to cover your feet. This is what it means to uncover your feet. It's to take a nap, right, to, to, to go to sleep. So she's uncovered, and then he realizes, behold, a woman lay at his feet. So... Those are, those are, I mean, I don't know if there are other arguments out there from the Bible in terms of, you know, trying to prove biblically that pants are only for men. So you've got like Deuteronomy 22.5, you don't put on women's clothes, men don't put on women's clothes, men, women don't put on men's clothes. Then you've got Daniel's three friends wearing hosen. You've got the linen breeches of the priest. And then you've got this idea that covering your feet is going to the bathroom. Um, because you know you pull your pants down and you sit down but covering your feet is not about that it's actually about um, uh, going to to sleep now I want to show you some verses in the Bible where I believe we can see both men and women actually wear skirts in the Bible wear wear this type of garment first of all in Lamentations 1 we do have a verse that refers to women wearing skirts in Lamentations 1, where the analogy is used of Jerusalem as a woman, and obviously the sin of Jerusalem, and being likened to a, a woman committing adultery or fornication. Jerusalem hath grievously sinned, therefore she is removed. All that honoured her despise her, because they have seen her nakedness. Yea, she sigheth and turneth backward. Her filthiness is in her skirts. She remembereth not her last end therefore she came down wonderfully she had no comforter O lord behold my affliction for the enemy hath magnified himself now not only that but see i think that there are verses in the bible that show that men actually wore these type of garments as well and these verses would not make sense if they only wore pant like garments let's go back to ruth 3 right where she's laying at his feet and look at what it says when he wakes up. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinswoman. So if you're wearing pants only, how do you spread pants over somebody else? But when you're wearing a skirt, that's the sort of garment that can be spread over somebody else. And also, now you know what was covering his feet. Right? So if you think about same with Saul, if, if he's covering his feet, well, what, what was covering their feet? It's the skirt that they're wearing that's covering their feet. Now you say, well, in 1 Samuel 24, it mentions here, yeah, it mentions that Saul was wearing a skirt. David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. But, you know, he's wearing pants underneath this robe, Victor. That's what he's wearing. He's wearing pants underneath the robe. He's wearing skirt outside of the pants right the robe and that's what david cut off well if you say that skirt here is not actually a skirt like garment it's just the, the ends of the robe or you know what does this robe even look like a lot of the pictures that you see of you know jewish people and even like muslim people wearing these robes they they do look like these long flowing skirts so even if you say okay well even if you say okay well this is not actually a skirt like we would think of as a skirt well, then you also remove the verse of women wearing skirts in the Bible too. Because if, when, when it says a, a man has a skirt and he's wearing a skirt, that doesn't mean a skirt. Well, then you can't use Lamentations where a woman's wearing a skirt to say that women wear skirts. So you would cancel out your own argument if you say a skirt is not a skirt. I mean, a skirt is either a skirt, if it's just the edge of a garment, then, then you don't have proof as well that women wear skirts in the Bible either. So let's look at some other verses. This one I think really convinced me that somebody must be wearing a skirt-like garment and not pants all the time to, uh, for this verse to even make sense. This is Exodus 20 when instruction is given about how to build an altar right after the Ten Commandments, right? So it says, hey, you don't build an altar with hewn stone, like stone that you've cut yourself. You build it with unhewn stone. What does that mean? That's just stones that you've just gathered that are just naturally formed rather than cutting it up into squares. You build that altar. But look at what God says about the altar. He says, you don't build steps up to the altar. 
right? Why should there not be steps unto mine altar? That thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Now, women are not serving in this capacity, right? To go and offer the sacrifice. They would bring their sacrifices, but then the priests who are men would do the sacrifice for them. Now, if um, a man who's a priest and God says, hey, don't build steps unto the altar, otherwise your nakedness would be discovered. How is your nakedness discovered if all you ever wear is pants, right? And, and a robe outside of that. Your nakedness would never be discovered. So how can it be discovered? Well, it can be discovered because if you're wearing a skirt-like garment and you're not wearing any linen breeches and you're walking up the steps, you can see how that nakedness can be discovered. <laughs> now, a man by the name of Jonathan Shelley, he came up with some, some creative answers to this verse. And I wanted to share some of them with you. One of them was, well, no, they're not wearing a skirt because your nakedness can also be discovered if you're just wearing like these really loose shorts. So his idea of what these guys were doing at the altar and what they were wearing, they were wearing like a bunch of footy shorts, right? You know, those loose shorts and then they kind of like stand like this and you can see the nakedness. That's how he's imagining the priests and those doing the sacrifices walking up these steps that the Israelites, you know, because obviously if they wore something around that, they're, they're, then their nakedness is not going to be discovered. So he thinks that they're wearing some sort of loose AFL shorts, and that's why your nakedness can be seen. The last argument that I heard in terms of, uh, of, of women wearing skirts in the Bible, so Lamentations was one, but like I said, if skirts in the Bible doesn't mean a skirt like we would think of it, it just means like the, the edge of your garment, then what verse would you have to even uh, show that a woman wears a skirt? This was the other one, and this is also a, a Jonathan Shelley argument, so I'll give him the credit for it. Gener Deuteronomy 22, this is what he says. He goes, a man shall not take his father's wife, nor discover his father's skirt. Now, how he interprets this passage is, what, it's, what he thinks it's saying is that a man's wife is being called his skirt. Now, I don't believe that's what this is saying here. I don't believe that this verse is equating that a wife is called a man's skirt but just think about it even if that was the case even if you interpret this passage this way to say oh look it's father's wife father's skirt that's why it's interchangeably using these two words therefore a wife is a skirt even if a wife was called a skirt that doesn't mean she's wearing a skirt right like if you're called something that doesn't mean you're necessarily wearing it but even so how, what would it make sense to call a wife, to, to compare a wife to something that the man doesn't even own? Because you see how it's the father's skirt, and you're saying, okay, a, a, a wife is referred to as a man's skirt, but if a man never has a skirt, what sense does it make to, to call him your wife's skirt? Like, if my wife only wears skirts, they're not my skirts. Like, the skirts in my wife's closet, they don't belong to me, right? So they're not my skirt. So even if my wife is called my skirt, it, it, wouldn't make, it wouldn't make sense to use the... Does that make sense? It wouldn't make sense to use the analogy that my wife is my skirt when I shouldn't be owning any skirts. So the fact that even if you take that analogy of it's the father's skirt, well, that means the father has a skirt. And if you're saying that that skirt is the thing that the wife wears, I just don't know how you get your head around that and, and use this verse to try and prove that point. And, and that's what I find with this. It's like, it's, it's because... That's what it's based on 20, Deuteronomy 22.5. And because that verse is not clear, they, they, it's, like, it's like the Muslim looking for Muhammad's name in the Bible. Like they're just trying to find it wherever they can because it's not there. And, and when it's not there, you have to just uh, reside to the fact that this is a principle. Um, it's not something that, we, that, that is just stated and therefore it's not something that can be just imposed on others. Uh, as, as a commandment of God as opposed to a preference. But let's look at some examples because <clears throat> we'll go through the table because maybe we can just think about this logically as well in terms of how uh, we categorize different clothes. So I've just got a table here um, where we can go through different types of clothes and just think, okay, there's a men's version and there's a women's version. So when we think of a hat, it can apply to both. And I think it can be the same be said about pants and... Um, and skirts. So let's say, for example, we think of a hat. How then do we differentiate between a men's hat, man's hat, and a woman's hat? Well, if you look up some examples, 
this is what it may, may look like. And now this is not just edicts from the Bible because like the Bible doesn't specify what is a man's hat and what's a woman's hat. In fact, the, the Bible talks about men uh, in the, in the wearing bonnets, you know, the priests wearing bonnets as they did about, did the work of God. And generally today, if a man wore a bonnet, you'd probably think it looks a little bit girly. It's not something that he would probably wear out and about. But God had them wearing bonnets. He had them wearing robes. So we see here that this is a cultural thing. This is something that maybe we look at it and we think it looks weird. We think it looks kind of girly, but that's the sort of things that, that they would wear. It may not look exactly like this, but you can see that there can be a distinction just culturally and just of opinion that there is something that is a man's garment. There is something that is a woman's garment. I'm just using things that would be familiar to us. You know, what about a scarf? You think a scarf, is there such things as a, as a men's scarf and a woman's scarf? But you can see that this applies to both. It's not that a hat is only for men or a hat is only for women. They apply to both and there is ver women version and men versions of these things. And here's some examples. You know, a man's scarf may look like this. A woman's scarf may be thinner and uh, use different colours and be lighter. These are just ways that people may differentiate. What about a shirt? We see like a man's business shirt as opposed to like a woman's business shirt. She may wear something like this. Like if a man wore something like this, you know, you culturally might just think, hey, that looks a bit feminine. Looks a little girly. What about a jumper? We've got some samples here. So a man's jumper, a woman's jumper, similar, but it could just be a difference in style, different in, difference in cut. What about gloves? You've got a man with his, uh, you know, thick black leather gloves. And a woman might have thin sort of lacy gloves, right? You wouldn't really want a, a man wearing that. But where does it say that in the Bible? Notice that these are just cultural opinions, uh, preferences that people have in terms of fashion. Uh, socks, got different here, black socks for men. And uh, women's socks might be like you know, a bit more stylish and fancy. Uh, men's shoes versus women's shoes. When we look at the difference, I mean, we, men don't wear really like these high heel kind of uh, sh open shoes like this. It would be more like women. So when it comes to a skirt, you may go, yeah, that's, that's surely that's a, that's a woman's garment. But in the Bible we see, well, but men wear skirts as well. So where do we see? Should, should this sit just here? And why, why when we look at every other article of clothing, there's so many other articles of clothing that go both, why doesn't a, why doesn't a skirt? go both ways as well when we see that in the Bible, when we see examples of skirts in the Bible. Um, and, and like I said, I think this is more a cultural thing when we think men wearing skirts, that's because in our culture it doesn't happen. But there are many cultures, you know, there are, it's like sometimes you've got to tell Americans there's more cultures in the world than just America. You know, just the United States. There are other, other countries in the world, there are Asian countries, other countries in the world where what the expected attire can be very different. And um, this is, a, I think it was a Fijian tour guide, and they call this garment in, in Fiji, it's called the Sulu. Uh, in Indonesia, it's called the Sarong. You know, my dad would wear Sarongs to sleep as well. This is just something that they would wear, and it's not class is feminine or masculine and there can be masculine sarongs and there can be feminine sarongs because a, ma a male may not wear like a pink you know flowery one in some cultures even though they wear that garment whereas a, you know obviously we're a bit more familiar with the female skirt the fashion and this is more like the western style but this is worn all throughout there are even like countries like this their dignitaries will wear something like this with a suit and with a tie and that's not seen as feminine at all in that culture and like i said when you look up pictures of what people believed about how the high priest dressed, these are the sort of pictures that you'll see. You'll see them with the bonnet, the chest plate, the, the robe that they would wear, and obviously underneath you'd be wearing the linen breeches. So most people, even you know, when they think about how God is describing the garments and what they traditionally wore, this is the sort of picture that they think of when they think of the high priest. So in light of the verses that I've shared with you, it makes sense that, yes, even though it's hard to accept culturally, in our culture it's not accepted, but in other cultures we see that there is a men and a women's skirt. So why would it be so unreasonable to think that pants as well, that this type of garment also has men and female versions, right? 
Now, what's an example? See, because usually the problem with women wearing pants is they're wearing pants that are too tight. They're wearing pants that are immodest. So that's a whole other topic of the clothes you're wearing not being modest, right? And what sort of clothes should you wear? But there is a difference between how men dress in pants and how women dress in pants, right? And one example would be like that. Men wearing more like sort of a work pant and women wearing more of a stylish but modest pants. And they look feminine. Like if a man wore that, most men in Australia would probably be ashamed to wear something like that. Uh, so it shows, goes to show that in your conscience, you can tell that there is a difference between men and women's clothing, even though they are the same style of cut. Now, what about, what about unisex clothing? Because in Deuteronomy 22.5, it says, don't wear women's clothing, don't wear uh, clothes that pertain to a woman, don't wear clothes that pertain to a man, but does that rule out the fact that there are clothes that do not pertain to either gender? You know, what if there is like a uniform or something? Or what if, uh, you know, what about like a costume? I, I'm just thinking of this right now. Like when you go and you rent a costume, I mean, is that costume a female costume or a male costume? Well, does it pertain to any gender? So are you, uh, do, do, do you get what I'm saying? So there are things that may not pertain to any gender. And I think of uniforms, I think of costumes where they may be different cuts but they may be very identical. I remember when I worked at McDonald's, you could get the same clothes. You know, where the women and the men, they get the same clothes. And it's the same with like costumes as well. So this leaves us with the question, well then how then do I know? How then do I figure out what is men's clothes and what is women's clothes? And because pe people will make the argument, well, if, the, if there is no garment that pertains to a woman or if there is no garment that pertains to a man well how, how do you keep this commandment have you ever heard that argument they'll say like well it doesn't make sense for god to give a commandment when he doesn't give us the specifics of how to keep this commandment but the thing is this is not the only commandment that god gives where it's a principle and we use the conscience we use other factors to decide how do we keep this commandment because if you say well i don't know what the gender specificity of this garment is how can i keep this commandment well how do you keep the commandment to dress modestly when god doesn't tell you what modest apparel is how do you keep the commandment to, to not wear costly array when he doesn't tell you what income level or what price something is costly array so notice how we have these things in the bible where we're told to do a certain thing but it's a principle by which we are to judge well, how's the best way I can follow that principle. And this is where it comes to issues of the conscience. Romans 14. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth, eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Look at this. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So you see there are, there are things in the Bible called doubtful disputations. The two examples we are given here in terms of what you can and can't eat. Also, what days you hold more holy than others. Some people say, well, you shouldn't work on this day or you know, on this holiday, we're not going to work, we're going to set it aside for the Lord. Hey, if they do that, hey, let every man be persuaded in their own mind. But if somebody doesn't do that, should you condemn them for making that choice where their conscience doesn't condemn them? No. So these are the sort of things like clothing as well. When we're given these principles and we're trying to decide the specifics of it, how do we decide these things? Well, it's based on conscience. It's based on culture. It's based on maybe counsel as well. Because there may be somebody giving you the opinion saying, hey, look, I think that looks a little bit girly and culture will see that as girly. It's probably best you don't wear that. Or, you know, you're not dressed very modestly there. You know, and you may take those opinions into account. That's why when I preach on topics like this, I give you my opinion. I tell you, hey, this is what I think is wise to dress this way or to wear these certain sorts of clothes to different occasions because wisdom would dictate that as opposed to biblical command. 
Look in 1 Corinthians 10. Again, using the example of what to eat. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. What does that mean? It seems there are, he's not just saying every, every, even sinful things are lawful for him. He's talking in the context of things that are of doubtful disputation, right? Things that are not, it's not a clear line between right and wrong. And he's saying, hey, where there's liberty within the Christian life, hey, there's nothing that's stopping me from doing these things, but all things are not expedient. He's saying, but it's not always the best to do. So what is he teaching here? All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Hey, just because it's okay for you to wear pants, does that mean it's, it's all right? Is it the best thing to do in every situation? Yeah, just because you're covered up, because you're wearing yoga pants and you're wearing tights, does that mean it's good for you to wear those sorts of clothes? Because when you wear those sorts of clothes, are you being modest? Are you being edifying to others? Are you setting the right example for the next generation? Is it expedient? Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth so you see here that as we choose we use this liberty we exercise this liberty as christians what should be on our mind how it affects others that's what we should be thinking about whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat asking no question for conscience sake so you see here it's all about the conscience here do you believe it's right or wrong to do even though it's not commanded of you for the earth is the lord's and the fullness thereof if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go Whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake. See, so not only is your conscience dictating, hey, whether or, should I do this? Is it going to make somebody else stumble? Is it going to set the wrong example? Am I pleasing to God? These are the sort of things that you ask of your, you know, your conscience is judging, right? And that's when you know, ah, oh, you know, I don't, this is not common, but ah, oh, this doesn't feel right, this doesn't, I don't think this is right. This is your conscience judging things. But here he goes, don't eat it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the law and the fullness thereof, conscience, I say, not thine own. Now he switches to like, hey, now it's like other, a per, other person's conscience thinks it's wrong. So you may abstain, not because it's a sin, but because you know the other person thinks it's wrong. You may not want to do it around them. I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? So he's saying it's not that their conscience condemns me for what I do, it's that my own conscience doesn't want to sin against their conscience in the sense I know that they believe it's wrong. Why would I do it in front of them and, and possibly lead them into sin? And this specific example is leading them into idolatry, right? Eating things that are sacrificed unto idols. And in terms of clothing, you may not want to necessarily wear specific clothes because you know people wear clothes to get noticed, to be immodest. So why would you want to encourage that by wearing those sort of clothes also? So these are the sort of questions to ask when you um, try and determine, hey, what are you going to wear? So when it comes to Deuteronomy 22, it's the same. It's the issue of the conscience. Do you believe that this garment should be worn by a man? Am I dressing feminine? These are the sort of questions to ask when you're trying to decide, hey, is this a garment that pertains to a man? Now, why do I think cross-dressing is always wrong? Because if somebody is intentionally cross-dressing, obviously they're in sin. Because they themselves, the fact that you're admitting that you're cross-dressing, that means you believe that you're putting on a woman's garment. Right? So that's why I believe if somebody's like cross-dressing is always wrong. Because the very definition of cross-dressing is that your intention is to wear something that does not pertain to your gender. Right? And then you are breaking this principle in conscience, not just in deed. But that's why I hope you can see here that God does not mention the specifics. So this is how we judge those things. And this is why it's not a sin in and of itself to wear for a woman to wear pants or a man to wear a skirt there's there are things to take into account like culture council um uh, the situation and things like that i'll just end on this point just from a personal point of view one is does my wife wear pants yes she does you know so she wears pants around the house you know she might wear pants when she's doing something that is requires manual labor you know what i mean where because you might want to wear pants where it's not safe to wear a skirt and things like that um, but also sometimes she wears pants to sleep as well she might wear pajama pants 
So, you know, if you ask my, my, my situation, does my wife ever wear pants? Yeah, sometimes she does. Has she ever worn pants out? She has before sometimes. But why does, what, when you see her, why is she normally wearing a skirt? What's the reason why, even though I don't believe it's a sin for a woman to wear pants, why is she always wearing a skirt? Well, number one is I think it looks better. I don't really like it when my wife you know, wears pants out because I think it looks, I, I actually prefer uh, the look of a skirt on a woman. I think it looks more feminine. But also, um, and that's just my opinion, but also I think it's more modest as well. It's more modest for a woman to wear a skirt. So I just think in, in most situations, it's a lot easier to be modest when you're wearing a skirt. And this is why, you know, people who may be overweight or people who are not proud to show their body, what do they do? Well, they, they wear looser clothes, they wear skirts and things like that because that just shows that it is more modest just from a cultural standpoint. So you, that's why you, sometimes things in life you don't just do because it's not a sin. You know, it's like I don't do it because it's a sin and I do it because it's not a sin. Sometimes you do things because of conscience. You're trying to think, hey, what's my example? What, what, what sort of picture am I giving? And things like that. You're thinking about that sort of stuff. Now, the other question you might be wondering is, Victor, do you wear skirts? <laughs> no, I don't wear skirts. Uh, mainly because it's not practical to do so. And in our culture, it, it would be a bit shameful for a man to wear a skirt. So no, I don't wear skirts um, ever. I've never, I've, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't say I've never put on a skirt because I probably have some time in my life. But ever since pastoring this church, like, no, I've, I've never wear a skirt. So I don't preach these sermons to justify my own skirt wearing. You know, I don't wear a skirt uh, because it's, it's, it's not really culturally accepted in Australia. But I would say this, you know, if I were in a country where the expected and respectful attire was to wear a skirt, like for, for whatever reason, like, you know, in the Fijian culture, that's why when you see the Fijians and some of the Samoans, they go to church, why are they wearing that skirt? Because to them, that's actually seen as dressing up. <laughs> they, they dress, they go to church in like suit attire, but then they dress up by putting that sulu around their skirt and now they're dressed for church. That's how they see that. So, you know, if I was in a culture and it was disrespectful in some way or another to wear a skirt, would I be adverse to wearing it? No, because I don't want to offend somebody for something that's not a sin to do. Um, if, if, you know, it's like Paul says, you know, you become all things to all men that by all means you may save one, uh, save some. So I'm not adverse to wearing it, but do I seek to wear one? No, because that's just how I've been brought up. That's what's culturally accepted here. And I think it's a little impractical as well. I think pants are a bit more practical uh, garment. Anyway, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. And uh, I just pray, Lord, that this sermon was uh, edifying to the people here. I know sometimes it's a topic that we can laugh about uh, and we talk about. But, uh, Lord, I just pray that, you know, ultimately I want our positions on anything to be biblical, to be sound. And uh, Lord, I just believe that, you know, the, the position that a lot of Baptists hold that, you know, women cannot wear pants, a sin for women to wear pants, just cannot be consistently and biblically defended and, and must sit in the area of conscience. And if it does, Lord, then if people have that preference, then so be it, but they can't condemn others for not having that preference. Lord, help us to always, uh, you know, think about the way we dress uh, for other reasons, you know, whether it be cultural, whether it be our example. May we always... Uh, have a conscience where we are seeking the wealth of somebody else, seeking the wealth of others, not just what we want to do, but what is best for you. Help us to be the most masculine and the most feminine that we can be. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us uh, with that. And um, we thank you, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.